Okay, let's continue, conclude chapter 13, talking about microfilaments and intermediate filaments, and then the last few slides are looking at um, some uh, techniques we can use to look at these cytoskeleton components. So the microfilaments, whoops, on the wrong page, there we go. Microfilaments are the thinnest, right? So only seven nanometers. They do have polarity, a plus n and a minus n. Um, they are formed with G actin monomers. So the G stands for globular. And then they make an F actin. And F stands for filament. So if you see F actin, you know that it has polymerized into this two strands twisted around each other, and each strand is made up of the G actin monomers. Actin binds ATP. So tubulin binds GTP, actin binds ATP, and again, G actin ATP is added more rapidly at the positive end than at the negative end, though both ends can grow and both ends can depolymerize. Um, the ATP is eventually hydrolyzed to ADP, just like microtubules, and very similarly, the book says that ATP is not necessarily required for uh, microfilament assembly. One of the ways you can tell the polarity, which is the minus end, which is the plus end, is if we artificially look at um, F actin with these myosin S1 fragments. So, This is artificial. Um, they have uh, broken the myosin S1 protein into uh, these two different fragments. The other fragment comes off. And basically what you're looking at is if this was the actin here, then you have these myosin fragments um, branching kind of off of it. And the pointed end is the minus and what we call the barbed end. It's like an arrow is the plus end. So that's if you were trying to look under a microscope and tell what was going on. Um, I added this slide. It wasn't in the original slides I put, but this is just a continuation of table 13.3 from your textbook. Um, talking about some of the drugs or chemical agents that can affect microfilaments. So, for instance, cytochaselin D um, prevents addition of new monomers to the plus end. So, the microfilaments will not continue to grow at the plus end, and it actually helps prevent loss. It's kind of like a cap. But remember, you still have that minus end that could slightly grow, slightly lose. Um, Lechonglin A, see, I don't know how to pronounce these either. Um, sequesters, so sequesters means binds. So it binds to actin monomers. So now you cannot polymerize. you don't have the free monomers to add to either end, you can still depolymerize. You can still grow shorter. Philodion um, from the death cap fungus binds and stabilizes assembled microfilaments, which means it's going to prevent growth or, or uh, polymerization or depolymerization. So you're going to see in your homework that you're going to do a graph, kind of like 
you they do in the book for microtubules. And so if I say again something, we add phyllodian in, something that stabilizes. If this is length and this is time, right? whatever you started out with, you just stay stable. And if you're preventing growth, but you can still depolymerize, you might start going down a little bit. So that's how you interpret the effects with regard to length of the growing microfilament chain. Lots of actin binding proteins um, listed in this book. I suggest you just make yourself a list and have them ready for answering questions. Um, one they talk about is the kind of concentration battle between thymosin beta-4 and profilin, right? So these both bind actin monomers, but thymosin beta-4 binds it and prevents polymerization. Profilin binds and actually helps add it to the growing actin filament. So if you have lots of thymosin beta-4, you're not going to polymerize. If you have lots of profilin or more profilin, you will grow your actin filaments. Um, formin listed right here. This is really important in making what we call the contractile ring. So when a cell grows, an animal cell grows and is ready to divide, it starts to pinch in the middle. And what's going to be formed right here is a contractile ring made of actin. And it's going to basically squeeze it tighter and tighter until you have two cells. So formin is the actin binding protein that you can see binds to these actin filaments, has kind of these long arms and kind of grabs these actin filaments and makes it grow. Um, I think this is a cool image showing some more actin binding proteins. So we have capping proteins, and now we know that capping proteins help stabilize ends of cytoskeleton components. Um, the ARP23 complex um, is important for branching, and we'll talk about that um, again, but you can see here this yellow complex. So now we're not just making long fibers, but we're actually connecting them. Okay. So it's actin to actin branching. Um, that's that one. Um, ADF cofillin which is the dark blue guy here, um, it's causing depolymerization at the minus end. It can also sever, so it can cut, break those um, microfilaments and maybe reattach here or cause a whole new plus minus end. Some other um, important actin binding proteins, so gelsolin, remember reading a little bit, and we'll, I'll show you an image of this in a minute, um, well let me just jump to it, let's go here. So you can have in the cell cortex over here kind of a gel, so the actin filaments are interacting together, they're a nice network, and they give the cell some structure. But if you want to move, then what this protein does is actually breaks the microfilaments, so it severs it, and it caps them, and this now makes this gel more fluid. So think about melting jello. Okay? So now it's more fluid, so now the cell, the cytoplasm, can move. 
So this is really important for movement. Movement. Um, here's another capping protein. Again, stabilizes, prevents um, polymerization or depolymerization at the end. There are filament bundling proteins like alpha actinin. Um, fimbrin is in microvilli, which we'll talk about in a minute. Alpha actinin is in focal adhesions, which we will talk about in another chapter. You can also have the actin in these mesh networks. So here we saw some of the proteins that help initiate the branching, and this is helping connect some of these um, microfilaments by cross-linking them. All right, so microfilaments will make nice meshworks. Just another image. Um, we're going to talk a lot next chapter about lamellipodium and philopodium. Right? They're both important in moving the membrane. Um, Lamellipodium does it more on a, a large scale. Philopodium are these long um, protrusions or structures. And in here you can see you've got your microfilaments and some bundling proteins, or you've got your microfilaments and branching proteins. Um, here again we just talked about focal adhesion. Um, this is for the cell to stick to things. So we will see next chapter that a cell kind of crawls, or you can think of like an inchworm. So it's going to, the cell is on a surface, so my cell, it's going to reach, and then it's going to hold on, and then it lets go over here and pulls it forward. I'll try to find some videos because that is a really pretty ugly picture. Um, microvilli, super important in your intestines. So microvilli are to increase the surface area so that you can absorb all those nutrients or non-nutrients as my lunch was today. And so the microvilli are made of microfilaments. This is quite different than cilia, which is important for moving the fluid outside of the cell, like we talked about um, lining your um, trachea. And this is kind of a cool picture of the terminal web. And in your book it talks about, um, I'll write it down here, myosin and spectrin. So more actin binding proteins. Um, you can see here intermediate filaments and microtubules. So all of these components are working together to give the cell structure and function. This is the picture from your book. Again, I like how it um, shows you some of the differences. So this meshwork is due to those proteins binding the different filaments. Branching is where you're actually connecting actin. actin. Um, it's branching from another one versus kind of crisscrossing. Um, stress fibers very important in cells that are not moving. Um, Lamellipodium and philopodium, again, very important in um, cells moving forward. Next chapter, we're going to talk a lot about myosin. So if you can imagine this little guy's head chopped off, that's the myosin S1 fragment that we, want, that we look at having it decorate the microfilament, the actin filament. So we're going to talk a lot about fibers and um, how that moves in muscles, um, actin and myosin. You can see you can connect myosin to organelles and move them along um, these actin filaments. Um, you have linker proteins that link these actin filaments to the cell membrane. So lots of internal movement um, are functions of microfilaments. In your book, there's a section about listeria. And what's super interesting, 
So here's the bacterium. What Listeria does is it takes advantage of this actin polymerization, and they talk about it being a jet propulsion. So what's happening is you have this protein, ENA, VASP, which is up here in orange. Oops, sorry, go away, go away. Um, and the bacterium actually has proteins, act A, that will um, bind to the ENA VSAP protein and promote growth of these actin filaments. And that pushes the bacteria. And it pushes the bacteria so hard, this is a little bacteria, that it can push it into a neighboring cell. So it's using the cell's own cytoskeleton machinery to move the bacteria from cell to cell. If you get a chance to take like a med micro class, which I teach, or a virology class, I think one of the coolest things is you can apply all the cell biology, general biology, um, immunology, microbiology, um, information and understand how these microbes, these pathogens that we deal with, these viruses, are constantly using our machinery for their own good. It's really pretty cool. The only thing I want to say about the Rho family GTPases is that we will be talking about GTPases a lot when we talk about signaling, and that is um, unit for our last unit. So I just wanted to put this slide in here. You don't need to know what each different GTPase does, um, but the way they work is they are getting information from the environment. And then they are relaying signals okay, through interacting with all these different proteins to potentially polymerize microfilaments or to break them down or contraction like in muscle to make them move past each other. And so the Rho GTP or the RAC GTP or the CDC42 GTP are enzymes that are involved in cell signaling. So we'll talk a lot more about this. So I want you to keep it in the back of your head. And this is just a, a um, showing um, how these two GTPases um, promote ARP, ARP23, which is the branching enzyme um, for uh, branching of the microfilaments. Okay. This figure I just throw up there because I think it's beautiful. Um, you can see it bigger if you want to zoom in. Um, it just shows how complex this is. You can see um, all these different actins and all the different um, actin binding proteins that interact um, and looking at some of these different structures in the cell. So that really concludes our microfilament part. Intermediate filaments, you can see the chapter gets shorter and shorter. Um, intermediate filaments are very diverse. So we have one, two, three, four, five classes of intermediate filaments, uh, cytosolic plus a nuclear class. So six classes total, five cytosolic, one nuclear. And we've talked about the lamins. So if you remember back in uh, chapter 16 probably when we were talking about the nucleus and they said that you could add detergent to a cell and basically dissolve everything away and still see the outline of the nucleus. And that was because the lamin or the nuclear lamina underneath that meshwork is made up of these intermediate filaments, and these are very stable. 
So compared to microtubules and microfilaments, which are continuously made and destroyed, made and destroyed, or broken down and polymerized and depolymerized, um, these are much more stable and they're not as soluble, so they can resist that detergent. Um, they're very tissue specific. So you can see there's some in epithelial cells and um, fibroblast and muscle and brain cells and nerve cells and more nerve cells. I thought it was super cool that the book talked about one of the ways they can um, identify cancer and what type of cancer and where it came from is based on the type of intermediate filaments. So you know that sometimes cancer can metastasize, which means it moves from where it started to a different location in the body. That can be a totally different cell type, and they can trace it back to its source based on the types of intermediate filaments. So here's just a diagram of how intermediate filaments are formed. Right there are these um, long monomers that form into a dimer, and then you have a tetramer, which means four. And you notice that they switch their N and C terminuses. So there is no polarity with intermediate filaments. Okay. So we don't have a plus N, we don't have a minus N, because it's, it's swapping all the time. And then they come together and form protofilaments and eventually form the intermediate filament. And remember these are, I don't want to say the wrong, 8 to 12 nanometers in size, so they're in between the big microtubules and the skinny microfilaments. The intermediate filaments you are most familiar with are things like keratin, which is in your hair and your nails, or birds' beaks and claws and things like that. These images are just to remind you of the nuclear lamin that we had talked about. So this network right under the nuclear membrane. Um, I think this is a really cool picture because look, you've got polymerase and trans, uh, transcription, sorry, happening here, the spliceosomes, you've got your nuclear pore complexes, and all these little red squigglies in there are lamins, you got a little bit of actin, you've got your mRNA. So just again to help you visualize what's happening in the cell. Um, again, I added this because I forgot earlier, but just part of your table 13.3, drugs that affect intermediate filaments, the one they talk about is acrylamide. Acrylamide is super interesting, I think I'm saying interesting a lot today. Um, it is an interesting chemical, we use it a lot in the lab. So if we're making SDS page gels, right, the gels that you learned about that help separate out proteins. Well, that gel is polymerized or made into a semi-solid by using acrylamide. That's the backbone. Um, and your book talked about how it's found in like some foods and things I didn't even know. Acrylamide is considered a neuro, oops, neurotoxin. And so you've got to wear gloves when it with it when it's liquid, it can absorb into your skin. And look at what it does: causes causes loss of intermediate filament networks. What's interesting about it is um, it's a neurotoxin. It doesn't really smell and it doesn't taste. So there was um, stories about a grad student putting acrylamide into their professor's. Um, coffee and it took a long time but the professor basically went crazy um, had neurological damage so his grad student had poisoned him 
Um, I will admit, graduate school is tough. Be prepared for a long haul, but don't do that. So acrylamide is the only um, drug that your book listed for intermediate filaments. This is an image from your textbook. I just think it's really pretty. Here in green are your intermediate filaments. Here are your microtubules. Plectin is an example of a spectra plakin, which just means connecting proteins. So these filaments, these tubules don't just interact with each other, but they interact, I guess I should say, they don't just interact with themselves, but they interact with each other as well. Oh, sorry. Um, and just so you know, this is a scanning electron microscope image that's been false colored. Okay, So you can see that basically they took a magic marker, however they do it, computerized, and colored all of these different components. So this is not immunofluorescence, right? Immunofluorescence is always going to have that um, black background. I'll show you some images. You don't get this 3D appearance. So this is an example of false coloring. This is just again to emphasize our three cytoskeleton components, microtubules, actin filaments, intermediate filaments. Um, you can get antibodies that are specific to the different types of cytoskeleton components and use immunofluorescence. Let's look at some more. Here's really pretty, I love this one, um, immunofluorescence using two different colors. Okay, so remember immunofluorescence is antibodies with a fluorescent flu or with a fluorescent label. Okay, so in order to get these antibodies into a cell in order to label these specific components, you have to kill the cells. So the cells are fixed on a slide, the antibodies are added, and in this case the microfilaments had an antibody that would stain them green, green fluorescent label, and the microtubules had orange. This is using fluorescence speckle microscopy. And speckle microscopy, my understanding is with live, so maybe I shouldn't have put it on this slide. Always interesting when you start lecturing. Um, anyways, I liked the image that was just showing you microtubules in yellow and the actin filaments in purple. Washout experiment, your book talks about, this has to use dead cells. And so what you're doing is you'll have a dish, okay, with a whole bunch of different wells in it, and maybe this is time zero, and this is time 30 minutes. And so you can add a chemical and kill these cells, time zero, um, use some kind of staining method in this case to um, look at the cytoskeleton and then that's all you can do with those cells. So in order to get this image you have to add the chemical, remove it, and that's the washout. Oops, oh, I hate it when it does that. Remove chemical, wait, and then stain. Okay, so dead cells, you can't watch this happen continuously. Um, unlike, let's just go to the next one, live cell fluorescence. So here is the exact same cell under the microscope, just 32 seconds later they took an image. And so this is where you could use like a, say, GFP actin fusion protein. So we've talked about using green fluorescent protein, making a fusion protein at the DNA level. It gets expressed in the cell, 
and how here you can watch <coughs> excuse me B grow and A go undergo depolymerization or shrinkage so live cell remember you're tagging the protein with a fluorescent um, another fluorescent protein sorry here's a different example of speckle microscopy and this is why I said this can be done with live cells okay. so here's the cells at four minutes seven and a half eleven and 14 unless those are seconds or now it's pretty fast might be seconds um, I don't know I don't know I guess I could look at the paper anyways this has um, actin in red and an actin binding protein vinculin in green and so you can watch the cell change shape over time with speckle microscopy what you're doing with this type of microscopy is you're actually injecting so you've got your cell and you can inject in some labeled proteins okay. so they were produced somewhere else so you've got the proteins you put them in there and then you watch what happens with them and this is sometimes an easier way to see things dynamically happening in the cells because if you start with like back here a GFP fusion everything is going to be labeled right whereas here you look at the new stuff how it's being incorporated um, how it's moving in the cell instead of the whole cell everything that's being expressed um, of that type being labeled I hope that makes sense um, last slide cytoskeleton all working together right? so you got microfilaments microtubules intermediate filaments um, and again we are going to keep building on these concepts so understand your different cytoskeleton components because as we um, go through the next few chapters we will be building on how these actually work in the cell alright thank you Ooh.